Today's episode is on dictionaries, but if you're just joining in and haven't seen the previous episodes, make sure you go back and catch up on those before moving on. I've provided a card in the top right corner as well as a link in the description below, which will both take you to a playlist that you can use to catch up. Alright, so before we get too far, we should probably clarify that when we say dictionary, we're not referencing that thick book you probably have lying around in your house somewhere and haven't used in years. Actually, dictionaries are one of the most abstract data structures which exist in computer science and can be used for a variety of purposes. Another thing we should clarify is that dictionaries are also sometimes called both maps and associative arrays by the computer science community. This more so has to do with language specifics and preferences and not any functional differences between them, since all of them work in almost identical ways, but for this series we're going to be referring to them as dictionaries to keep things simple and organized. Now at the end of the last episode we said that dictionaries mark our journey into the more specialized data structures, and I think you'll see that that truly is the case with this one. With that being said, let's hop into today's agenda. First, we'll be covering some basic information about the dictionary. Then, we'll talk about some of the properties associated with dictionaries, such as some of the restrictions which come with using them. Then, we'll take a quick detour and talk a little bit about hash tables and hash functions. Then, we'll do an example with hash tables and hash functions. And then, with that knowledge, we'll be able to cover the time complexity equations surrounding the dictionary to close out the episode. The timestamps on your screen will take you to each of these topics, so feel free to skip around if you want. Now, a dictionary in computer science, by definition, is an abstract data structure which stores data in the form of key value pairs. This means that we have two main parts to a dictionary element, the key and the value. Each value has a special key associated with it, and together they create a pair which is stored in the dictionary data structure as an element of that dictionary. Think of a key value pair like a social security number. Each social security number is a key, which is then paired with a value, that value being an individual person. These social security number key value pairs then come together to form a dictionary of every human contained within the United States. This is very different from many of the data structures we've talked about previously, because we index dictionaries using these keys instead of, say, a numerical index. For example, with an array, we would index each element within the data structure according to a numerical value which started at zero and ran the length of the array. With a dictionary, however, we would index each element by using its key, instead of some arbitrary integer, and obtain information through that method instead. So what exactly are these key value pairs going to look like? Well, they can be just about anything. The keys in a key value pair can be pretty much any primitive data type that you can think of. We can have a dictionary which has integers as the keys, one with strings as the keys, one with doubles as the keys. There's really a lot of flexibility. As for the values, well, we have even more flexibility with those. We can have keys in a dictionary correspond to pretty much anything. Strings? Sure. Booleans? Of course. Even another dictionary with its own set of key value pairs? You can actually do that as well. This allows us to have tons of combinations in the way that we store our data which makes dictionaries very powerful. Now, as amazing as they are, though, there are two extremely important restrictions that we have to cover when it comes to dictionaries, and they are as follows. Every key can only appear once within the dictionary, and each key can only have one value. Let's start with the first one. Each key has to be unique, and cannot be replicated, duplicated, cloned, copied, or anything else that would cause there to be two keys of the same value within a dictionary. Think of it like this. When you create a key value pair, the computer creates a little locked box in memory to store the value in your key value pair. Then the computer spends days and weeks creating a customized, handcrafted, one of a kind key that corresponds directly to that locked box. This key cannot be replicated in the slightest, and that's the mindset that you should use when working with dictionaries. No two keys can be the same. If you were to try to make a dictionary with two similar keys, you would get thrown an error. The second stipulation is that each key can only have one value. Think back to our custom key. It wouldn't make sense for this one-of-a-kind key to be able to open multiple boxes. The same is true for our keys in computer science. They can only go towards one value. Now, just as a little aside, one rule that we don't have to follow is that there can be duplicates of values within a dictionary, meaning we can have two separate keys both point towards equivalent values as long as the keys are different. The computer doesn't care. Alright, now that we know what dictionaries are and how they work a little bit, 
Let's jump into the time complexity equations for a dictionary, or at least try to. Let me explain. Now, for a dictionary, the time complexity equations are a little bit funky. Previously, we talked about linked lists and how they are sometimes used as the backing of other data structures. For example, a stack might implement the linked list structure as its way of storing information in memory. Well, the most common way to use a dictionary is to implement it with what's known as a hash table. Hash tables are a little more advanced than the content that I wanted to cover in this series, but they are an extremely important part of dictionaries, especially when it comes to the time complexity, so we're going to have to do a little mini lesson on them today. Doing this will help you better understand the time complexity equations for a dictionary. Alright, let's begin. Here's a little scenario for you. So we have a dictionary which contains a few key value pairs like shown on your screen now, where the position that a cell is in the table also corresponds to its key in the key value pair stored in our dictionary. So the zeroth cell would contain a key with the integer 0, the fourth cell would contain a key with the integer 4, and so on. Any cell which we don't have a key for is empty, or what the computer scientists refer to as nil. Why does this not work? Why can't we just use an array like this to back our dictionary in memory, since it looks like everything would run in constant time since all the keys correspond to their table values in memory? Well, this isn't actually the case, because it's based upon the simple assumption that the size of the array is not too large. Sure, this might work great for a dictionary where we have 10 or so elements. But let's say, instead of 10 elements, we have a dictionary we want to use which has 10 values which are sporadically placed from 1 to a billion. We want to keep the keys as being in the same index position as their values so that we know exactly where they are and can run operations in constant time, but by my count that is 999,999,990 nil values just taking up space in memory, and that is not good whatsoever. So what's the answer? Well, this is where hash tables come in. Hash tables are fundamentally a way to store this information so that we're able to cut down on the amount of nil values while also allowing for the information to be stored in such a way that it is easily accessible. Basically, using a hash table, we'd be able to store these 10 keys in our dictionary, which are ranged from 1 to a billion, in a table with only 10 elements while also being able to keep constant time. How do we do this? Well, through the use of a trick programmers use known as hash functions. A hash function will take all the keys for a given dictionary and strategically map them to certain index locations in a table so that they can eventually be retrieved easily. Essentially, by giving a hash function both a key and a table to map it to, it can determine what index location to store that key at in the array. These hash functions can be pretty much anything. The goal of a good hashing function is to take in a key and reliably place it somewhere in the array so that it can be accessed later. So, with all that being said, let's say we have a dictionary which contains keys which are integers from 1 to a billion by a factor of 10. So, the keys would be 1, 10, 100, 1000, 10,000, 100,000, and so on. A good hash function for this might be to take the number, divide it by itself, and then multiply by the number of digits in that number minus 1. So, to find out where to put the key 1 million, we take a million, divide it by itself, which yields 1, and then multiply that by the number of digits in the integer minus 1, in this case 6. That means we'd store the key 1 million at index location 6. Now if we do this for every key in the dictionary, we can see that each key in the key value pair is stored at some index from 0 to 9. We have consolidated the 10 keys from 1 to a billion into 10 index slots instead of a billion. A pretty good improvement in my opinion. You might think that this is a little overcomplicated for just 10 numbers, but remember, sometimes we might be working with a dictionary which contains thousands of integers, ranging in the billions, or even strings which is a whole other story. The best part about hash functions? Now let's say that we wanted to get the value which is paired with the 1 million key. All we would need to do is put 1 million into our hash function, and it'll tell us where that key value pair is stored within the hash table, in this case at the 6th index, and then we'd be able to retrieve that value from the key value pair. Now all this information may be pretty confusing, I know, but in layman's terms, for this video and this series, all I want you to be able to comprehend is that dictionaries are built upon these hash tables, 
and the keys in our key value pairs are stored in memory in these hash tables at indexes which are determined by a hash function. And if you can understand that, you've got a pretty good base for understanding hash tables. Now the final thing I want to talk about in regards to hash tables and the reason that dictionary time complexity equations are funky has to do with one small problem. What happens when we run two different dictionary keys into a hash function and they return the same index location to be stored at within the hash table? For example, let's say we have two dictionary keys with the strings Stephen and Sean, and when we run it through our hash function, it's telling us to put both of them at the ninth index location. We can't do that. How are we supposed to put both of them at index location 9? This is what's known as a hash collision and can be addressed in one of two ways open addressing and closed addressing. With open addressing, we just put the key in some other index location separate from the one returned to us by the hash function. This is usually done by just looking for the next nil value in the table, i.e. the closest location which contains no key already. So with our example, the key Steven would get hashed to index location 9, mostly because it's a better name, and the inferior key Sean would end up getting stored at index location 10 because it's the closest open location available. Now this does make it harder to interact with the data in our dictionary later on, which is why computer scientists developed closed addressing, which works a little bit differently. Closed addressing uses linked lists to chain together keys which result in the same hash value. So the keys Stephen and Sean would get stored in a linked list at the index location 9. The main drawback to this is that when we want to interact with the values stored in the key value pair for either Stephen or Sean, we would have to look through the linked list for the key that we want. If there are 200 keys hashed to one index, that's not good. So there are definitely pros and cons to each methodology of working with collisions. Okay, mini lesson on hash tables concluded. Now we can get into the time complexity equations for a dictionary. Now in our episode on time complexity, I mentioned that for time complexity equations, we generally measure a data structure based on its worst case scenario. But when it comes to dictionaries, if we are to assume the worst case scenario, we end up assuming that our hash function makes it so that every key value pair ends up at the same index, meaning each of our keys gets stored in a linked list. And then, worst case scenario, we have to assume that every operation functions how it would for accessing, searching for, inserting, or deleting from a linked list, which, if you remember, is O of n for all four. This, of course, is preposterous and would probably never happen with a bare minimum decent hash function, which is why I'll also go over the average time complexity for each of these four operations. Now, lucky for us, they're all going to be O of 1 and this has to do with those hash functions that we talked about. To get, look for, insert, or delete a key value pair from our dictionary, all we need to do is run that key for the key value pair through our hash function and it'll tell us where in the hash table to go in order to get, look for, insert, or delete one of our key value pairs. And that is the power of the hash table in the flesh. Dictionaries are a very useful data structure when it comes to computer science for a few reasons. They differ from the rest in the fact that they don't use a numerical index to retrieve values. The fact that the keys and the key value pairs can be a range of types from strings to integers to chars and so on makes it easier to consolidate the data. And this, combined with the hash table implementation, allows for super quick utilization and is sure to come in handy on any program that you write. That concludes our discussion on dictionaries. Next week, we will look at another data structure named after a real-world object, the tree, so stay tuned for that. Thanks for making it to the end of the video. These videos can sometimes take quite a while to research, script out, and create visuals for, not to mention the audio recording and editing process. In total, these episodes can take up to 12 hours start to finish, so we appreciate you sticking around to the end. If you like this type of content and want it delivered to your subscription box free of charge, click the link on the right of your screen now to subscribe to the channel. As an added bonus, if you click the bell next to the subscribe button, we'll tell the big ups at YouTube to notify you when a new video is uploaded for no additional fee. And if you can't wait that long and are craving more of my melodic voice, you can click the playlist on the left of your screen now, which will take you to a playlist containing more programming fun. Until next time, peace.